Hey, Turtle fans, I'm here with Kyle Roberts, the famous stop motion director, creator of the of so many things, but mostly from my point of view, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle trailer, which he recreated last year. But this is a long uh, history that he's had with the turtles. And uh, hi, Kyle. How are you? Happy New Year. Doing all right. Thanks for having me. You bet. Well, um, thanks for joining us. You're uh, outside Oklahoma City. Have you been there for a long time? I have. This is actually an OKC hat we got <laughs> going on. I uh, actually came here for college, went to Oklahoma Christian University, and kind of fell in love with people here, good old people, good old Oklahomans, some Okies. Uh, and this is a great town to film in because everyone's so excited, you know, about film in general and projects. We have a great rebate program. Right. Uh, it's really been exploding the last several years. So um, you go back with the turtles to the to the early '90s when you told me one time that you saw the movie at a drive-in theater. Tell me about that experience, will you? Yeah, that's right. My parents. I think I was five, five or six, and my parents took me to the film, uh, and it was a drive-in, uh, and it was the first film I remember seeing uh, anywhere, and let alone a drive-in. I remember that they gave us like this plush doll, this Raphael plush doll. Uh, for kids under you know a certain age or whatever that they got for free for going. So from that moment on, I was I was hooked. I was a turtle fan. Well, um, so you would have followed it, but when did you actually start doing stop motion, and how did it, how did you uh, figure out to do turtles in, as part of that? Yeah, like a lot of people, I think it was I don't know oh nine or two thousand ten or so when DSLR uh, photography and filmmaking uh, really started to take off. Uh, not that stop motion is easy, <laughs> uh, but it became more attainable at that time because you can use different software. I use, use Dragon Frame stop motion and hook it up to your computer real time. You're not like clicking, you know, old VHS, you know, or something. Uh, and it was, I, I actually went to see uh, Fantastic Mr. Fox with my nephews and we were just blown away uh, by the creativity and how real everything looked and kind of this tan it, like tangible, uh, see it, touch it, taste it, you know, organic feel that the movie had. Uh, and we just get, became so inspired. We were like, we could do this, you know, we could figure this out. And so that kind of started that journey as we just started playing uh, with Ninja Turtles and X-Men, you know, different action figures. And the first one that we put together was recreating the 1987 uh, Ninja Turtles open because one of my favorite shows growing up, of course, uh, frame by frame uh, with action figures. <laughs> right. It was, it was so fun to do. So you used the original uh, Playmate toys back then, right? This is before NECA. This, uh, they, they, we had NECA toys, but it was um, from, kind of based on like the original comics, like the Eastman and Laird comics. Oh yeah. Uh, okay. so they all had red bandanas and then I went in and like painted all of them different colors. Uh, and we used those, because those, those were the most articulating turtles at the time. Uh, so we use that to kind of recreate uh, this epic, you know, cartoon intro. And we even redid the song. We got together with like this garage rock band called the Boom Bang. Uh, and that, if you look at the comments, like that part has got mixed, <laughs> mixed reviews. But if you know the Turtles, you know Eastman Laird, that's kind of how they started. It's like this yeah. punk rock, garage rock, you know, like, hey, let's make a thing and make, it, make each other laugh and, you know, kind of mix and match all these things together. And so that's kind of what we did. It was kind of home brewed, you know, uh, of course, NECA had the action figures, but we did all this doodle art background almost to look like a kid, you know, could do it. Right. Uh, and it's kind of their imagination or a 20 some year olds imagination, you know, coming to life <laughs> kind of thing. And that's basically what we did. It got picked up by LA Times and USA Today and Wired Magazine and millions and millions of views. It was just was crazy to us because that was the first thing we did. And it really kind of showed me that even though we're, we're recreating something, it's a fan-made thing, that I kind of have a voice uh, and it can be heard, you know, through animation, through filmmaking. Mm -hmm. um, and, and even like locally, we're at a coffee shop, uh, Nathan Poppy and I, he's the one that did all the doodle art background stuff and did right. a great job at it. And that's its own art, of course, itself, of like carefully kind of creating and doing these kind of cross-stitch stuff like Eastman Laird did uh, with the turtles back in the day. Uh, and still doing, um, but we were at a coffee shop and someone heard us talking about it because at that point it was like 100,000 views, 200,000, it was just growing like crazy and just right. getting pinged of all these you know people writing about it. Uh, and someone 
said, do you guys make that? Because they heard us talking about it. And they said, hold on. And it's like, can you stand up? And I was like, okay. <laughs> and he just gave me a big hug and just said, thank you. Thank you for that nostalgia. Um, and that, that was kind of a moment where I realized that's what this is. We're like providing nostalgia, a gift of nostalgia for people, which is something that you can't really explain. It's intangible value that has then gone on to, now we've done commercial work for Lego and Hasbro, and we have a Voltron back here that we did a national spot for them. And you know, all this stuff that kind of started with us just playing and creating, uh, but us realizing like, this isn't just a job. It's like, it's a gift. And it's a gift for some, sometimes major brands to be able to give to their audience. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we have that in common because every time I experience turtle fans, it's like, it, it's this, um, it's this amazing rapport you have because the, the, they mean so much to people. It's, it, you know, particularly people who are in their thirties and forties who experience the turtles for the first time, maybe their first movies in it. And it seems to have an amazing emotional connection. That's uh that's and that's always been a thrill for me. I'll be honest with you. I feel like, uh, but this year with the 30th anniversary, it's become even more visceral, where people are just com coming out of the woodwork. Despite the COVID, we've been right. able to we've been able to connect with a lot of fans, um, you know, using YouTube and and um, and things like with this interview that we're doing today. But tell me a little bit more about the the stop motion process because are you self taught? Did you just pick it up and try to, you didn't go to college to learn this skill. No, I, I double majored in college of broadcast journalism and corporate media. So that, that taught me some of the groundwork of filmmaking and uh, marketing, you know, and that kind of stuff. Right. Uh, but I did not go to school for stop motion or anything. I just started playing, you know, started playing with toys and figuring out uh, how that, you know, when you're moving, actually our next project, spoiler alert, is uh, Karate Kid. Uh, that we're doing for Icon Heroes. So we were kind of testing them out today. We're building the rigs uh, for them right now. But oh. these, these figures, uh, I believe, are out now. You can find on their on their site. But they're, or, or, or are releasing really soon. Uh, but that's something we're kind of getting geared up for uh, next. Uh, but but it's, just, it's just playing and trying to figure out, you know, what works, what doesn't work. And, and one thing is I, I always encourage uh, people, if they're looking to get into stop motion, is just Pick something you're very passionate about because that's another intangible value that's going to show uh, in the final project. And it's going to be what, you know, really kind of fuels you and fires you, you know, puts fire under you. And when you're 12 hours into an animation day or something like that, uh, for maybe four or five seconds of, you know, final product, you're going to work that much harder uh, in, into getting every frame just right. And that's, that's very much what happened with that Turtles the first one and then the one we did with the 90s one this past year for Nickelodeon uh, is, you know, each frame, we really took it to heart uh, and kind of, because we are the target audience, right? right so it's right. like, we're thinking about who the target audience is and every project we take on, I promise you, uh, if you're creating anything for YouTube or commercial work or film work, whatever, if you keep your target audience in mind the entire time and kind of take to heart and take a mindset that you're earning the right to be heard, from that target audience, it's going to succeed every time. Wow. Well, that's 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 great advice for anybody who's looking to get into well, not just the entertainment industry, but really any any business where there's sales going on, or yep. where you're trying to impress people with with what it is, what your product is. But absolutely. So listen, in the background, you have a gr a, a green mat. It looks like yeah. uh, that has a couple of awards sitting on it. Those <laughs> Emmys, are they not? Yeah, just a couple of Emmys floating around back there uh, that we have. The one was for a national spot we did for the Thunder, uh, our local basketball team here in Oklahoma City, NBA Thunder. Uh, and another one was a short form uh, documentary that we did um, uh, that was for Kyle Dillingham, who's like this worldwide um, renounced violinist. Uh, it's, it's kind of his story kind of thing. Wow. Well, cool. Well, congratulations on those. You, I'm sure that you're going to fill up a, a, a shelf full as time goes on because your work is is remarkable. You sent us some samples of this, and I, I, you know the green screen is important because in understanding what the process is all about, uh, one of the behind the scenes piece you have Raphael kicking, for instance, and that kick yep. you have a little. It looks like a rough piece of of um, 
of cord coming out of his back that's wrapped in green. So talk about the green screen and why that works uh, the way it does. Will yeah. you? I think there are a lot of fans who'd probably be, you know, really fascinated by right how it works. So on this, we come up with different animation rigs. Uh, this is square stock. You could just pick up at any hardware store or possibly Hobby Lobby or something. Uh, right. craft store. But basically we take them in the same color that either our green or blue screen is. Right. And then we, we drill, a lot of times drill into their back or their front and then have the opposite end of this square stock. So it's keeping them intact the whole time and able to move them around. And as you can see, this really stays into place every time I move it. And this base is no joke either. It's probably 20 pounds uh, by itself. So you can really lift them up in the air and it's not gonna, <laughs> it's not gonna fall over or fall down. So th that allows you to do these micro frame by frame movements, right? Yep. So you, 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 you explained the other day to me about, about the frame rates and how important that is in terms of uh, the, the look of the, of the project. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so in stop motion, you're either shooting on ones or shooting on twos. And you could typically either shoot 24 frames a second or 23.976, right. <laughs> basically 24. Or a lot of other common one is 15 uh, and 12. So 12 is basically half of that. Uh, that's called shooting on ones. No, shooting on twos, 12, half of that. And right. basically what that does is double every other frame. Uh, yeah. So there's certain films, and it's just the animation style, uh, shooting on uh, twos uh, is shooting um, 24 frames a second, and that's very, very smooth, very fluid. Uh, shooting on ones and then doubling every other frame is uh, more like Fantastic Mr. Fox, Isle of Dogs, and it just kind of has a little bit more of a jittery, probably like this is looking right now, right. <laughs> a jittery kind of stop motion look to it. And it's just an artistic preference on what you want to do. Of course, when you're shooting 12 frames a second, it's less frames that you have to capture in the, the overall process. But if that's the look you're going for, uh, that can help tremendously as well, because it's literally half uh, the amount of frames and work sort of that you have to do. Right, right. Okay. So that work, you, you said you could do like five seconds in a 12 hour day. Talk about that and that process, how, what, you, what you have to go through. How many people are involved? Yeah. So uh, for example, we did this stop motion series, like little like three minute webisodes for DreamWorks for Trolls. And that process was 75 people over 10 months, I think. Uh, so that was from writing. We, we literally wrote it in conjunction with them, storyboarded it for them. Uh, kind of soup to nuts is what they say, right? Okay. Uh, like the whole, the whole process working with them, we fabricated the trolls. Even It was based out of Hasbro heads, but then we fabricated them because the trolls didn't move. They were stationary. So we right. fabricated them and um, made them so they could uh, move around. Uh, it's this um, paint and um, silicone uh, mix, pigment kind of mix that you inject and have our wire armature underneath it. Uh, so basically we like fabricate our own ar trolls armatures that were teeny tiny and that was its own challenge. But, but basically over, we had 70 people total, but even in the animation stage, that was probably six months. Uh, we had four animators for that. Uh, one we brought over from Ro Robot Chicken. Uh, I'm really proud of all the work that she did on it. Um, and on average, we got four or five seconds a day in like a 10 to 12 hour animation day. Wow, and when you say you you got you you capture, what do you capture on? What what kind of uh, cameras do you use? Yeah, we use DSLR cameras. So like in our current workflow, we just use Canon 7D Mark IIs. Uh, uh, we capture into a computer. Like I don't know if you can see, I have an iMac back there, or have a laptop that's then right. uh, going Bluetooth uh, to our our display here, uh, and you can see some giant turtles in the back. <laughs> But, uh, and so we're able to see everything really big right in front of us. Um, and we capture it frame by frame. We use dragon frame stop motion for our software. So we can really look at our onion layers and really see, you know, from where we were to where we're going. Uh, and it's just in real time. Yeah, real time. So again, not that stop motion is easy, uh, but it makes it much more accessible than, than ever before. Sure, sure. But when you say animators, that's, you're talking about people who actually move the the figures one yep. frame at a time. Yes, so, yes. Yeah, so in stop motion world, the animator is the person physically there with their hand moving them sometimes less than a millimeter, you know, at a time. 
uh, frame by frame. Um, and, and basically that's the process is get everything kind of shot and in the can. And then we talked about that like four seconds a day kind of thing. And roughly the same kind of amount of like man hours it takes to capture it. And that's after everything, after scripting and storyboarding and fabricating, right? <laughs> that's just the animation. The post-production side takes just about the same amount of time because you're going through and now even though you know, maybe we're painting these or whatever to get them close, you right. still most of the time have to go through and rotoscope out all these different uh, rigs that we have hooked up to them. So you're going through frame by frame. So if it's 24 frames a second, that's that much longer in post that you're right. going through and creating a mask and after effects and rotoscoping out. And, and that's a big part of the magic, right? Because if you just have an action figure, this is an old school Michelangelo one, by the way, but if uh, you have an action figure and you're just playing with it and falls over, that's it, right? Like that's, that's part of the big thing of you know, getting a rig, nice rig set up to them the whole time, but then having to take out that rig uh mask it out paint it out frame by frame uh in post-production which takes, is what the rotoscoping process is and what 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 program do you edit on we use the adobe suite so for rotoscoping we just use after effects you import everything you just shot uh so it, basically in um dragon frame it just captures tons of images so say for even that 87 you know initial one of the 90s uh initial one we had thousands and thousands of final images that are captured you just take each scene, you import it as an image sequence in After Effects, and that reads it as like a movie, basically, like one file. And you bring it in uh, to the same frame that you shot it at, whatever that is. Uh, and, and then we use that to um, paint out, you know, the rigs that we have uh, every single frame. Well, uh, one, of the, one of the really cool things is you, uh, you sent me a link to one of your uh, samples where you did a side-by-side -side comparison to the live action versus the, uh, the, the stop motion. And it's, it's remarkable how close they are. <laughs> Obviously we had a guide to work with, but that's gotta be laborious. I mean, it's gotta be like, like so like nitpicky. Absolutely, I'm gonna get one thing for you real quick. I'm gonna get a Ninja Turtle, a NECA one. <clears throat> Sorry, maybe we can cut that or just use it. <laughs> but we got uh, a NECA uh, Michelangelo here, right? And right. obviously they're so detailed and so great to work with. And that's why beginning of quarantine and we knew there was the 30th anniversary and we love the turtles. We're like, let's just do this thing. So we contacted Nickelodeon. They're like, yeah, we're all about it. NECA sent us the figures and they were all about it. And we're really excited about it. And we just kind of brought this thing to life. But um they're so detailed they articulate super super well which is great but even though they articulate super well there's certain times where you can only go so far right like you can only uh, maneuver them and they have a double jointed knee and double jointed elbows which is great and all those things that kind of make it more doable but so it's its own craft of itself of taking each thing we literally pulled the original uh trailer and i think i could send you guys this too like a pdf of all of the storyboards and kind of made our own process of like shot 1A, 1B, 1C, wow. uh, and made up, made up a sto giant storyboard and pasted every single scene and used that as an animatic at the time, basically animatic, the, the original trailer uh, right. behind us. So even as we're shooting, there's a little square that's the original shot and we're looking at that frame by frame as they're going in and moving them a little bit by a little bit. But still, even with that, you still have to figure out okay, well, he's not actually, you know, that Raphael one, he's not actually, can't actually kick that high. So then you lower the camera and do a different angle so it looks like oh, yeah, okay. higher. So it's kind of its own own art and own process itself that we've kind of geeked out and kind of somewhat developed in the last almost 10 years of, uh, of figuring this out and kind of doing this recreation of our own you know, version of uh, as fans, what this looks like and what this could mean right. at, with toys. So again, the whole idea anyway is like, when I was a kid and like playing with these, uh, that's what you're doing, right? You're like mimicking the movie and telling your own stories and doing this stuff that like now that we could do that and bring that to life and bring so much kind of joy and nostalgia to people, it's, you can't even explain that feeling. Yeah, that's, that's for sure. So um, tell me what's next for you? Yeah, <laughs> uh, like I said, we're working on that Karate Kid stop motion. Uh, we are wrapping like a national broadcast spot uh, for Hasbro. 
can't say what it is, uh, but we're wrapping up that. And then we're also working on a live action feature length film uh, called What Rhymes With Reason that's kind of inspired by the book of the Bible, uh, Job, set in modern day high school world. And the main need for it uh, is teen anxiety and depression and ultimately suicide, which is just far too common today, especially right now. Uh, all of these things, and, and they're really wrestling with this and kind of trying to deal with all these things together through this big kind of epic adventure journey that they go on. Wow, that's that's a remarkable <laughs> other side of the world from stop motion turtles, right. but uh, it's what's in your heart. Yeah, exactly. Now, our first, my first feature film, so as we're doing all this stop motion stuff and uh, you know, people are writing about it and sharing it and posting it, the number one question we always got is like, when's the first feature film? You know, <laughs> when's that coming out? And so that was the Post-Human Project, which is a live action feature film that got picked up by Gravitas Ventures and is on iTunes and Amazon for free. Uh, I think it's on Tubi TV, someone said, but it, it went all over the world as for an independent film, you know, very micro budget. Uh, it's made 180% of what we made it for, which is always great, as you know, <laughs> uh, for a film. Um, but that's something we really, we just like the turtles and growing up with the turtles, is something we really, you know, dove into with that film is using uh, kind of superpowers as a metaphor for teen adolescence. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's something we really dive into in that film uh, as, as these it's a live action film as teenagers get superpowers as, as they're about to graduate and uh, save the world and, and get back uh, for graduation because you know they're still high school kids and, and need to graduate. But yeah, wow, wow, that that's. Uh... That's remarkable, but that's now manifested in a new script is what rhymes with reason. Yep. Well, anyway, we were talking about some um, some future turtle plans. I know you've thought about a lot about uh, what would be what would be the coolest thing. Talk a little bit about what you uh, what your vision of the next turtles or what the turtles could be. Like elevator pitch or just in general? Yeah, yeah elevator pitch. <laughs> Okay, we'll do like the very, very basic version. Uh, but I just think it would be so cool to have Karai and Rat King as your main villains and have this very, very personal story with the turtles where he he can control Splinter, right? So that makes it inherent. That's that's their sensei, their father. Mm -hmm. uh, and that that immediately makes this makes the tone very real just like in the first film when, when shredder like captures him or whatever but for, but for for them that he's being completely controlled so that he can't do anything right i say he's completely helpless uh, -huh. uh and i just i just have this this vision i guess uh of the turtles and it's christmas time so you argue whether this is a christmas movie or not <laughs> you know like die hard and a lot of these other big time action films uh lethal weapon he, he actually can probably like do a call to to referencing a lot of those at different times and be be, be a very turtle thing to, as called right different things but but basically this kind of like spy espionage in the winter in new york turtles versus karai and uh rat king would be awesome <laughs> it would be awesome <laughs> you're right you're right well um now you'd want to do that live action we'd go we'd go back and get um and get um uh, Brian Henson to uh, actually maybe recreate some costumes that would look like the like they did back then, but using new technology. I think it would be amazing. They have to. I mean, they did a great job on Labyrinth and you know, everything else that's going on. Like, I think that would be that'd be killer. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, there's. Um, I think that there's an, enough appetite amongst the fans for it. The question is, you know, and, and I, you know, when you look at what DC does and what Marvel does, it it's apparent that um, that every one of these franchises has uh, legs on it that that people didn't think about before. I mean, you know, um, Wonder Woman has become a, an amazing character now as a result of their just applying uh, some new energy to the to the brand, and I yep. think the same would be true of the Turtles for sure. Um, Absolutely. We just talked about Cobra Kai and how, how well that's exploding. I'm, I'm genuinely very excited uh, for season three to come out. I think this weekend. Uh, yeah, my, my son running. is too. He's like, they, they got a lot of trailers running on it. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, you know, it's interesting because the original 
Karate Kids were were choreographed by Pat Johnson, who choreographed oh, the awesome. tour. And, That's awesome. I did not know that. Yeah. And uh, Pat was like the guy in Hollywood to choreograph uh, fight scenes uh, using, using um, martial arts. And yeah. uh, when the time came for us to do Turtles, there, he was really the only choice uh, because he, he knew how to work with actors and, and with producers and directors so that it flowed in a way that, and, you know, it, working in North Carolina, it was the, it was the worst because it was so hot in these sound stages. Yeah. And uh, even though, you know, a, a lot of the fight scenes were done in the relative dark, there was, there wasn't a lot of heat from the lamps that were, that would normally heat up a set in a right. way that you wouldn't tolerate. But the temperature outside the sound stages in North Carolina was like 105 and it was about, uh, just oh. about a hundred percent humidity so you, yeah. could, you could feel the sweat dripping in, inside these costumes and yeah. um you know those those fight scenes with the foot were all like very intense yeah and, um they were pretty heavy right like do you remember how much they the costumes weighed well the 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 original costumes the talking turtles were about 70 pounds okay but i think the the um the stunt turtles the guys who did all the fight scenes yeah. were probably more like 35 or, you know. And still adding that on top of you, you ever, like, it was big in the 90s to have these, like, ankle things to try to jump higher in basketball. Yeah. <laughs> you ever, like, have that and try to jog in those? And those are, like, 10 pounds. And yeah. 70 pounds of that and everything that you're used to doing and equipping yourself for, that's... The well, the, you know, and the fact that, that the, the suits themselves, I mean, if you think of a, a, about a wetsuit that covers your entire body and then, but it was, it was thick and, um, and, uh, you know, while you could breathe, they had, you know, they had plenty of breathing holes and all that. It was still like, it, they were cumbersome, no question about it. Um, the, uh, the foot, the foot clan had costumes that were much more, uh, you know, uh, malleable and, and easy to, easy to uh, work in. But, you know, with them, there were, there were, there were a fair few, um, you know, what would I say, victims of, of the turtle uh, uh, fighting techniques that, that ended up, you know, not in hospital necessarily, but they were, they oh were God. laid out pretty well. There were, there were, we went through a lot of stunt guys on that first film, that's for sure. That's awesome. And what's up, you talk about breathing holes. What's up with uh, seeing their eyes sometimes? There's like that classic Donatello where he's like laughing and you see his eyes in his yeah. mouth. Well, or his you know, mouth in a mouth or whatever it is. It's like, crazy. well, you know, this is well before um, uh, rotoscoping, rotoscoping. And <laughs> was, was affordable. Well, and, you know, w the problem that we, that we encountered on the picture was that we had a very limited budget. Right. Um, and there were, there were certain scenes that, that just couldn't get shot. Because when, when the turtle costumes melted down, when the, when the electronics inside the suits, you know, fried mm -hmm. um, because of the humidity and, and other stuff, we had to stop and, and in effect, wait for them to, to recover. Um, and that was, that was a, a time-consuming thing. And, you know, the, again, this, this, the sound stages up in North Carolina weren't the friendliest things to work with. I remember Brian Henson was talking about one scene where um, they were shooting some, some close-up stuff uh, and, uh, and they had big lights shining on a, on a big uh, bounce whiteboard and there were literally thousands of, of flies flying around the sound stage landing on everybody. It was like, it oh was my gosh. Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, you know, but if it wasn't that, it was something else. And, and uh, we had the, of course, the airport was right close by. And that was, that was causing uh, problems with the, with the comm systems. So yeah. whenever we had, you know, the, the radio frequencies that we're using in the, in the airplanes were the same as they were using in, in, for the radio control models or the radio controllers that we were using to uh, manipulate the, the facial movements and stuff. And that, that screwed things up. It was like, you know, it was like um, uh, uh, the Murphy's Law on steroids. Uh, where if it could go wrong, it did go wrong. But somehow or another, Steve uh, Barron was so patient and so um, 
understanding of the process that he figured out, you know, workarounds and, and, uh, and made things work. Even when like Judith refers to, uh, to uh, the, uh, many of the scenes she had where she was supposed to be sh shot against a, a turtle. Yeah. And in fact, what was happening was there was a, there was a, a C stand with a, with a big paper plate on it with a big happy face on it. And, <laughs> and that was the turtle she was acting against. So yeah. uh, uh, actors, you know, with, with um, uh, uh, Elias and, and Judith, they both had to, you know, perform scenes where there was nobody on the other side, nobody reacting to what it was they were doing. And that's really hard. It's yeah. not an easy thing because even though there could be a script supervisor or an AD feeding lines, it was still, it was still, you know, not what you'd expect. Because once they got used to being with the turtles, they wanted to, they wanted to be with the turtles. You know? yeah. So it was, uh, but that's, you know, that's the challenge of filmmaking. But so when it came to fixing a few things in post, there just wasn't enough money left to do it. Wow. Um, I think well, the original. Now. Well, rotoscope, just a few things, nothing crazy. It's not George Lucas, right? But just a few of those weird things. But more than that, what I would love to see, and I think a lot of Turtle fans, is when are we going to get some like deleted scenes uh, or, you know, bonus material? In <sighs> well, you know, I, I wish that, I wish that the, um, we were, last year we were trying to find the original cut negative, um, which was supposed to be in a lab, either in London or New York, a Technicolor lab. Um, and we tried for a couple of months to try and find it, and we, we just couldn't find the original cut negative. Um, no. We have the original, the, the master, but the right. cut negative is the, where you could really go in and do color correction. Right. Um, and uh, that, was, that seemed to have uh, disappeared in the process. I know that uh, Steve had some deleted scenes. There were some scenes that were deleted that were just never shot. You know, oh, and you saw in that in that screenplay that I sent yeah. you, that, it was um, quite a bit beefier. Uh, yeah, there were there were a lot of scenes that were long that just got cut down, and yeah. that was mostly budgetary. Uh, right. Sometimes it was editorial, sometimes it was for story, but you know, the original screenplay that that um, that Todd and Bobby wrote was you know had these elements in it that just some of them never got shot. Right. Um, and that's not, uh, uh, you know, terribly unusual, uh, given that you usually you, you you try to limit yourself to twelve hour days um, yeah. in order to avoid, you know, super overtime. But right. uh, you know, like you like you do, you have to you have to monitor your the hours you put in so that you can um, you can you know fit inside a budget, right? Absolutely, I can't even imagine that you know dealing with all the technical issues and overheating of stuff and you know everything else so you, you have to figure out how does this you know, what's the, still the best story we could tell and it's amazing it's still it's one of my favorite films by the way by far and speaking of, of judith like how awesome of a job does she do like she's still very much april o'neill to me like she is kind of the quintessential april and no one's ever going to change my mind <laughs> so that <laughs> Well, I, I think that's, that's uh, you know, she's got a lot of uh, fans who feel the same way, no doubt about it. I, she did an amazing job because, you know, I think that she had great chemistry with Elias and that was um, first and foremost, you know, when actors get together, you could tell. Um, and they didn't really have a great deal of time to rehearse or to, mm -hmm. to uh, work out the, the, the dialogue scenes and all that. A lot mm -hmm. of it was just yeah. done as they, as they went along. But yeah. they just had this, uh, you know, first of all, I think that living in that, it's like a crucible when you, when you, when you work together and you live together in this, in this uh, small community, they, they, uh, you know, they got to know one another pretty well. And, and as did um, Steve and, uh, and Brian, they yeah. all kind of hung out a lot. And uh, I think that, that adds to it, but you know, you, um, Judith is like, was like the, um, was like the glue to the cat. She was the only woman, first of all, and that yeah. that made for you know m most guys were were you know paid attention to her. She had a lot. She commanded a lot of respect on the on the um, on the set because she had enough experience. And a lot of the um, a lot of the actors on the set weren't nearly as experienced as she was. Uh, you know, if you you look at um, 
at uh, Sam Rockwell, who plays the the thug. You know, it was his first film, and yeah. uh, he and Leaf Leaf uh, were were. Um, I think they they met on that stage. They remained great friends uh, through for for all these years, and um, you know, so a lot of a lot of the actors were getting their you know just getting their chops. This was a young cast uh, yeah. for the most part, and um, so yeah. Uh, I think Judith holds that that um, that place in a lot of people's hearts for sure. Yeah. But you know, now listen, you know, we're we're going to try and combine the the um, the first movie into the second movie. You know, we ha we're just finishing the 30th anniversary year, yeah. but we never really got to celebrate it in person with a lot of the fans. So whether or not the the COVID ends soon enough for us to have Comic Con next summer, I don't know. Maybe maybe there will be. But um, you know, the, when we did the first film uh, after the after the second um, after the second weekend, it had done well enough that um, the Golden Harvest ordered an, another movie. So we immediately went into production on the second film, um, right. and that that allowed us to release virtually day and date a, a year later um uh, the the second movie which was uh which was a remarkable achievement given uh, usually how long it takes to gear up but oh, yeah. we had a lot of the of, of the sets we had certainly the the creature shop was up to speed by that time and um, was that script already in process or is that like we got to get down and John Hughes style right in a weekend and <laughs> get it yeah, going. You know, it's, it's funny because Todd Langdon, uh, who wrote the second picture, um, talks about how the first picture he, and we're, we're going to try and do an interview with him. I'd love to introduce you to him. He's a great yeah. guy. Um, but he said that the, the one thing that happened was that um, Steve Barron, when he came along after, you know, Bobby and he finished the script, they, uh, Steve Barron didn't change anything. He just accepted at, you know, kind of verbatim. Now the, the actors, you know, would work out their lines and maybe change a word or two here or there. But for the most part, the, the, um, the movie script doesn't have any, what, what are known as colored pages. Whereas the second script, which I had somewhere around here, I don't know what I did with it. Anyway, it has, it's nothing but colored pages. It goes, it, it, there were changes from, and as Todd, uh, relates it was it was made by committee whereas the first picture was just bobby and him and 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 steve they were really the only people who weighed in on the screenplay um and uh except for kevin and peter of course who had a lot to say about about everything but the second picture was there was a toy company involved the 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 uh, now new line wants to be involved and golden harvest had a bigger hand in in what was going to happen and all of that and um so don't use weapons don't do this I'm yeah a, a total total um well we were we were reacting to a lot of different um input right, right? Right. Uh, right and part of which was actually jim henson jim henson originally wasn't really interested in doing the picture because it was violent because right. most of his career he had done stuff that now it was edgy he had he had lots of stuff that was very edgy but not violent per se right. so right. um now i think we've we've crossed that that bar uh, i don't think we can ever turn back from you know whether it's whether it's the violence or the edginess or whatever we've you know we've we've piled it on for the kids right. in this in this generation right <laughs> There's nothing they haven't seen, right? Right, absolutely. So, um, but, um, you know, go back, let's go back for a moment to some of the scenes, some of the, the behind the scenes pieces that you uh, you shared with us. One is this Raphael kick. Um, yeah. And it's it's only like 10 seconds long, the, the video, but yeah. it shows like one frame of, of, uh, of uh, action, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think... Most of it is, it is the trailer, right? So most of the shots, I think were like a second, maybe some more a second and a half or whatever. Uh, so it, we may be animating a whole day and get one or two of those done, uh, maybe three or four. So if we get four seconds in a day, we maybe get three or four, depending on what they're doing. And a lot of times we'll animate each uh, character separately. So that Raphael kick, we animated Raphael. For several hours and then each foot soldier or maybe sometimes it's two at a time kind of thing 
uh, uh -huh. but th so they're all separate and not competing, you know, with each other. So then um, you composite it in post. So you lay those put those layers in in post. Yeah, I know. I sent you a video uh, in the sewers in the turtles layer uh, of Don Tello kind of doing a flip, and they're all kind of fighting, you know, different right. and stuff. And that was kind of every step of the process. It was every step of the process. So from us kind of doodle arting, do, doing the doodle art in the background, and then colorizing it, doing all the animation, rotoscoping that animation uh going in through and then compositing every element together so it's like Raphael is like in the back michelangelo is in the back leonardo i think is in the front some foot soldiers are in frame in front as the cameras you know, moving to the side and donatello is like back flipping and kick something out of you know a weapon or something out of the foot soldier's hand and all that's a second and a half total but then you composite all those things together uh to make you know some of the magic happen well you can see why, why it takes so, so many hours and it's so yeah. intense Yep. And, and, and it's got to be right. That's the thing about it is that, you know, when you do live action pictures, you know, what you get is what you get. Sometimes you, you know, you see it in the, in, the, in the playback and you go, well, let's do that again. But oftentimes, you know, particularly when we were shooting the, the turtles, we, we were shooting on film. And yeah. while there was some assist, you know, you just had to trust what you're, what you're actually, uh, what, the, what you saw. The, yeah. the directors had... The directors paid a lot more attention then, it, it seems to me, when you were shooting film than they do today. Because yeah. now, oftentimes, the director's head is in the is in the the playback, you know, yeah. and they they now have um, actual. Um, and I think this is what's going to happen in, in the in the future is you'll have um, glasses that you'll wear that will have the playback running at the same time you're shooting, so you can you can actually see. Um, what you've just shot, just you know, with a with a flick of an eye, you know, you go back and That'd this awesome. is all the new technology that's coming on. Video village visuals. How about that? Yeah. Something like that. Video yeah. village goggles. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that I mean, well, we'll do a playback of that of that scene with uh, with Donnie and and uh, and show you show the fans how that all happened, what you just explained, which is the coolest. Now, do you have any other uh, turtle stop motion things in the offing? I don't think so. Not right now. I mean, we'll see, no. uh, you know, if we want to work on something or if Nickelodeon calls us up again. But at the moment, we do not. All right. Well, now, Seth Rogen is doing a new picture, we understand, you know, an animated picture right. um, that would seem to have some need for your kind of services, it seems. Sure. But I don't know. You haven't had any conversations with Seth. No. Nope. Seth, my buddy Seth, uh, hasn't called me, called me yet. No, I don't know Seth Rogen. <laughs> uh, he hasn't called me up and said, yo, Kyle, we need this. Come on. Well, you know, it's funny because, um, you know, I think Seth and a few other actors got their, at least their, one of their early projects was the, the show Freaks and Geeks. Oh, right. Yeah. And Gabe Sachs was the executive producer. He created that show. And Gabe was working with Gary Cropper and I yeah. when, when we first got the rights to the Turtles. As a matter of fact, he was in the office the day we got the comic book. Oh, that's awesome. um, Gary had sent the comic from, from Detroit. And uh, Gabe was a student at SC. And um, he went to Temple. And I think he went to the same Temple as Jay Shanker. Oh, that's awesome. And, Jay's been, what, uh, do you know what comic it was? Um, yeah, it was, the first, it was the first comic. Um, it was yeah. the very first uh, cool. one, and, and the, I think it was the second printing of the first comic. Right. Um, yeah, that's that's so cool. It's so fun on that the first film. How much is influenced by like the first ten or eleven, you know, comics? Uh, right. I think like Leonardo one, which was somewhere like between nine and ten of the original run or whatever. Yeah. And then Turtles ten or whatever, is very similar to what happened to Raphael and getting thrown through. Uh, the glass and you know all that that's going on so when you see that it's like oh this is you could tell and I don't know you know I wasn't there of course I was five years old uh, but you could tell so much love and care and again are kind of earning the right to be heard thinking about the target audience where where the original material came from and taking that to heart happened you know yeah. how much of that happened in the original film and that's what shows in the final product yeah. well thanks it's uh, I think that you know the the the, the like, as you recognize, the credit really goes back to Kevin and Peter because right. um, their creative juices were so, were were on fire at the time, and I think that's what Gary recognized immediately is that this was something that was so totally different, 
that it would be, it would appeal to kids in particular, even though the comics, the original comics, they, I don't think they had any intention right. of, uh, of uh, having a kid audience say. But they're so cool. And there's, so, again, like I was saying with that Christmas, the idea or holiday, there's in those original ones, like I think it's Ninja Turtles 9, 10, and Leo 1 or whatever. Right. There's so many great shots that they drew, uh, black and white, and then IDW did a really good job of colorizing those. Yeah. Um, where those are not, they're awesome. But you just see like Leo and his uh, katana in the snow in New York, and you know, it's just awesome. Like, yeah. the whole, <laughs> it's just so. Uh, but, but yeah, that well, thing, yeah, go ahead. No, you know, I was just going to say, you're, you're great to have such great memories of the turtles. Let me ask you about the, when you storyboard, yeah. um, because the, the, you know, the comic book served as almost a storyboard for us, yep. uh, in, in, in a lot of ways. Um, but when you storyboard, do you use a software program? Do you use Toon Boom? Yeah, so um, we've done Toon Boom sometimes for some animatics that we've done. So taking the storyboards and going from there. We've done a mixture of physically just drawing out the storyboards and really, really quickly. Uh, a lot of, two of our, uh, Jonathan Coles is one of our great uh, storyboard artists that worked with us on Trolls and Lego Voltron, lots of projects. But he uh, just uses Photoshop, layers them, draws them in. He has a um, Cintiq, right? <laughs> uh, and I'm not an artist. He wouldn't want to see me draw anything. <laughs> Uh, right. but, but it uses his antique and his display and uh, it layers, layers it all up so that we can edit with it in a, photo, in a Photoshop layer um, in either After Effects or Toon Boom or whatever uh, for the animatic to really move them around a little uh -huh. bit. Better, I think. So we can really, because that's the animatic, especially in stop motion, in any form of animation, is so important uh, for the client. So Lego DreamWorks, whatever, uh, to show them where this is going because we can't spend 12 hour days for four seconds and not be what they sure <laughs> sure yeah and, and and make mistakes you, you know i think um um a, a lot of things that's why in, in you know in today's world with uh, pre-visualization um and using the the this new technique of filming called the that they used on the mandalorian called the volume Yep. where everything is displayed on the big uh, on the big screen on the big LED screen yep. that technique is is actually revolutionizing the film industry because where you used to sh you know shoot and then fix it in post yep. now you do everything in advance you shoot it, you basically all your backgrounds everything you have to pre-visualize everything yep. and um, th that's really a throwback to um, to um, uh, the Godfather, and when when um, you know uh, he was directing those pictures, uh, remind me his name. Um, uh, 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 Coppola. Uh, oh, Francis Coppola. Francis Francis Ford Coppola. Uh, yeah. Uh, right. Well, uh, when Coppola was doing those pictures, he, he was he he created one of the very first pre-visualization techniques using eight millimeter cameras. He would go in and. and using small models and other things and storyboards, he'd create the entire picture in advance. So he knew, you know, what the, what the, uh, what that, to do. And Turtle Tech, you can, you can edit that yeah. thing out, right? <laughs> okay. So oh. before that, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, uh, cut you off, whatever. Before that, Ray Harryhausen in Stop Motion World really did that. It had all of his backgrounds and it made them in like three or four different versions. And of course, Disney with their, uh, Right, what they call it, but they roll them and have the background behind it and all that kind right, of Right, that's right. Action, you're absolutely right. Godfather is to set its own kind of standard of what they were doing at the time. Yeah, for sure. On our, oh, on our actual reboot of the first picture. Yeah. yeah, that that'd be a, that'd be an interesting um, thing. What do you yeah, think? So that that's basically would be my take on it. Do live action, possibly you know in volume on some of it where you're really able to build this together. What's great about that, like you talked about with Mandalorian, is you're getting that light, just like with me right now. You're not, you're not masking that. That light is hitting their face. It's all there, and that's why it feels very kind of tangible and organic and real, because it's right there. <laughs> you know, right. there's, no, there's no other, I mean, I'm sure there are, you know, post-production still needed and visual effects and stuff, but that initial compositing is right there. It's happening. You know, it's happening right there in front of your eyes, so you can, you can visualize it, you know, all right there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, about that turtles concept. I mean, I, I love that. I love kind of this idea. Of maybe after one, maybe right after two, after they've like defeated Shredder and 
and they're in that newspaper, you know, at the end that's like Ninja Rap is born or whatever. I yeah. kind of love the idea. If it's maybe right after two, uh, it could be after three, depending. Three is kind of a, a one-off, sort of, you know, of, it, of its own own individualized story, uh, which is great. But it could be kind of after any of those. But basically, where New York has turtle fever, you know, so they've kind of like seen them in the paper and experienced them, and they're like so jazzed and excited. Uh, that my my general idea is that New York, some of it's the mayor or whatever, like throws them a giant party uh, for for all the work they've done and kind of taking out you know the foot of shredder and then Karai and Rat King are kind of in the sewers you know like working out this takeover and this heist of the party kind of thing. That's uh -huh. that's kind of what I think would be dope and really fun. But I would love to see. I mean, this is your channel is is turtle fans, you know, so I would love to see what they think. Uh, yeah, me too. Uh, well, we'll do that. We'll shout out to the turtle fans and say, "Come on, let's let's uh, let's get some ideas, and we'll pound it back into Hollywood." You know, Hollywood has become a virtual place now um, because of because, not just because of COVID, but over the past few years with uh, incentives happening in various places like Oklahoma, yep. um, by the way, which has a really good incentive uh, mm -hmm. to shoot movies, live action film film yep. as well. I don't know, do the, the commercials qualify? Yep, commercial. Uh, so even that that uh, SVOD and all that's like blending together, right? Uh -huh. like Amazon and all these things. So even like the series we've done for DreamWorks that qualified and it's up to a 37% cash back on the whole budget. Wow. Uh, so um, yeah. It's, so this uh, is the reason for us to come and shoot in Oklahoma, isn't it? Yeah, no, we, we just took over a giant, it's Cops Convention Center, and they're building massive sound stages here for the first time. So just here in the next year, you're going to see uh, television shows and filmed in front of possibly a live studio audience at some point, uh, sometime soon anyway. Uh, yeah. The first time ever for Oklahomans, and it's, it's really exciting. Uh, Scorsese is filming uh, here this summer, Killer Flower Moon, I think is what it's called. Uh, and just lots of lots of big time things um, on the on the up and up for sure. That's very cool. Well, and you'll shoot your picture up there, yeah. Yep, yep. Here in a few days in Colorado is the plan. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Well, well, Kyle, I can't thank you enough for your time. You've been fantastic. You've given the fans a lot of insight into the secrets of uh, stop motion photography and. And animation, but it's uh, you know I know you're going to get uh, uh, even more fans as a result, not just of this, but of your continued work uh, uh, with toy companies and with uh, with other with other groups. Is there a toy out there that you that you've seen that you would love to animate? Mm, I don't know. We just like to play and create. Like I said, I'm probably just most passionate and excited about the current <laughs> thing we're doing. So like yeah. I said, we're working on this Karate Kid uh, for Icon Heroes right now. And it's awesome. Like it looks really good, uh, and so we're going to get into animating that. Um, uh huh. Next. So. Well, wow, fantastic. Well, good turtle idea. power, right? <laughs> turtle power as always. I love it. Well, um, Kyle, thank you. Happy New Year to you, and uh, our best wishes and thanks for your time, dude. Happy New Year's. Okay. Peace. Bye.